You're listening to We Deep in Media. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Deepen with Christina. I'm your host, Christina Weber, founder and CEO of We Deepen, Feminine Weapon, and also a certified professional coach and matchmaker. If you haven't lately, go to wedeepen.com, hit on that social calendar, and check out all the upcoming social and transformational experiences. We curate these experiences with a goal in mind to help you have more meaningful, loving relationships. All of these experiences are amazing on their own. And once they're woven together and there's creates a journey and people are journeying through these experiences and bonds build best over time. So you get to see people again and again and again. And it's community that's being created that's not confined to one particular location, one particular modality, one particular leader, and everybody is a part of it. So definitely go to wedeepen.com, check that out. Also, if you're interested in private matchmaking or relationship coaching, there is a a database that you can submit yourself into. There's very specific questions that I ask so I can get to know you. Um, there's a small fee of $25 to um, be a part of that database. I'll reach out after, or you can even reach out to me and we'll get the conversation going. If you do enjoy this podcast, please do like, subscribe, follow, rate it. It helps me to continue to host it and helps more people find it. Give it five stars. Also share it with a friend because why I love speaking with you and connecting with you um, by sharing these amazing people who I feature as guests, what I enjoy even most is being with you in person. So today's guest is a repeat, Francesca Gentile. And Francesca was first featured in episode number 30, The Power of BDSM. Her and I were both at Relate Fest. I was a producer of Relate Fest, and Francesca was one of our keynote speakers. And a reason that I called her back was because in episode 74, and I'll include links to both of these episodes in the show notes. Uh, but in episode 74, which is a very popular episode on, on the podcast, um, Hedonia, it's about Hedonia, the adult sensual retreat um, that happened here in Austin, Texas. It happens annually. Um, and in the podcast, Lola had mentioned how many women fantasize about rape. And I just couldn't, I, I couldn't leave that out in the open. I had to go back and unpack this because... Um, you know, that that's a really sensitive topic. And, and how confusing could that be for a man to listen to that and 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 hear that, you know, in the, in the time of Me Too and Time's Up, that there are women that fantasize about rape. How confusing is that? Um, and I do hear stories, you know, as I'm doing some of my one on one coaching of women share these situations of these men that they're super attracted to that, you know, throw them up against the wall and they have their first kiss. So Francesca is an expert in sexuality, um, BDSM. She's been in this field for, I believe, over 50 years. Is that correct? <laughs> I, I'm not that anxious. <laughs> over 30. Oh, um, over 30. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, your expertise is so grand that it it seems that way. You have the significant experience. I think that when we first spoke, you mentioned of, you know, your journey beginning in your 20s yes. um, into this work. So thank you, Francesca, for joining me for another another episode. Oh, I'm so delighted to be here. And, you know, in our culture around the world today, sex really is still so confusing. We long for it. It excites us. It delights us on a good day. But on a bad day, it's like, how did I get here? What just happened? Why is it not working? And it's really because our religions shame our sexuality. Porn actually gives us unrealistic expectations of sexuality. Romance movies and shows give us unrealistic expectations of relationship. And there's really only 17 out of 50 states teach accurate sex education, 17. 
and only 22 have to teach sex education at all. So we're turning to porn. We're shamed by religion. And then we're turning to porn to try to figure out what sex is. And it's a movie. I've been a porn extra. You know, it's not actually the way people have sex at home in their life. And yet we then we look at this and say, oh, this is what we should be doing. So I'm delighted to give some real the real information that I collect in sexology, the field of sexology in neurobiology and with human beings on the front lines of life around the world. So ask away. Let's dig in. Well, let's start there with this idea that you know, women fantasize about being raped. Yeah, well, well, interesting point uh, that I would like to bring up is that although uh, some of the latest studies say that approximately 61% of women fantasize about rape, guess what? 57% of men do too, about Mm -hmm. being raped. So it's not just women, but we have a tendency about to look at women. But why would anyone look at a fantasy about being forced, you know, kind of forced to do something? You know, I'm I'm going to have my way with you. You don't have a choice. Now, when we look at fantasies, fantasies are kind of like dreams. They come with a symbolic or deeper message. So if I dreamed, five people dreamed about sitting on a chair, one person that chair might mean support, somebody else that chair might mean rest, someone else that chair might mean, you know, their queendom or their kingdom. It's not the same for all five people. We need to dig a little deeper to say, what does a chair mean? So this idea of being forced, taken, having to do something that, oh, no, if you weren't forcing me, Christina, I would never do that. (gasps) is often a compensation for religion that has shamed me. So when religion has shamed me and said, I can't have desire, I can't just go for what I want. I wouldn't be a good man or a good girl, a good woman, if I just said, I have all this desire. It is a brilliant, our psyche gives us fantasies and dreams to try to nourish us in ways that we're depleted. Mm. So here, someone else in my fantasy comes in And their forcefulness gives me permission to access the desires that I don't give myself permission toward. Now, I want to say something really important about fantasies as well. So I I have a fantasy about being ravished by a pirate. In my fantasy, it's always a golden sunset. I'm wearing a delicious full-length blue silk gown that the wind is sort of pressing against my body. My hair is flowing in the breeze. And then in the distance, it's a pirate ship. And even though he's really pretty far away, somehow I can see clearly that there's a handsome man at the prow of that boat. And even though the wind is blowing my hair back beautifully, it's somehow still blowing his hair back beautifully. And and I'm like, oh, no. And somehow, even though the boat is still pretty far away, I am somehow frozen in place in delicious adrenalized fear and anticipation, dopamine, patient. So I'm like waiting expectantly as his boat comes closer and closer. These are great hormones, by the way. Human beings love, we love our dopamine. Mm. Dopamine is anticipation and reward. We love it in shopping. We love it in gambling. We love it in anything new. So if you like anything new, traveling, going to a new place, uh, trying a new thing, trying a new tech toy. If you like anything new, you like dopamine. If you like going to uh, some sort of new adventure, you like dopamine. If you like shopping, you like dopamine. If you like gambling, you like dopamine. And we also like dopamine in our relationships. Excite me, inspire me, surprise me. We often fall in quote unquote lust or love because of the feeling of dopamine, this kind of anticipation and the adrenaline, this sense of like excitement, nervousness, excitement, nervousness. So our bodies like this particular cocktail. It feels good in it. And the fantasy, I am the, you know, I'm the pusher of my own cocktail. I can give myself exactly the right amount. So here he is. He's sailing towards me. He gets in his rowboat. He rows to me. 
he sweeps me off my feet. He brings me back to the boat and he, you know, throws me down on the deck and takes my clothes off and ravishes me. Now, in my fantasy, even though he's throwing me down on the deck, I am not hurt by that. In my fantasy, I don't get wood splinters up my back or my butt. In my fantasy, even though he's like, in a sense, almost ripping my clothes off, when I look to the right, they are nicely folded. Because in real life, if you ripped off my favorite blue silk floor length dress and it ripped, it, I'd be like, fuck this shit. You ripped my dress. This is not going to work. Mm -hmm. If I'm having now splinters in my butt, I'm like going to be heck no, stop. But in my fantasy, it's all perfect. And I never have to say, as he's biting my neck, I never have to say, no, not that spot, a little higher, a little lower, to the right, to the left, to the right, to the left. <gasps> there. I never have to adjust that. He just, in my fantasy, bites just the right point. I never have to say it's that time of the month where my nipples are sensitive. Please, you know, approach them with delicacy. I don't have to say anything in my fantasy because he perfectly, even if he's raping me, he's perfectly attuning. Attuning is seeing, feeling, and hearing accurately all my little signals. He's perfectly attuning to the instrument, the Stradivarius violin that my body is. So my fit, the one of the things to get is a woman's or, or a man's rape fantasy. They're still in charge of it. It is not. It's what's called consensual non-consent in BDSM. It's not the dominant is now having their way with the submissive in a way that the submissive doesn't get to say no, stop, different or what they don't like. We know that in BDSM, the world of kink and BDSM, the submissives actually has to be in charge. And in our fantasy, we're in charge. We are in charge. And so I've had partners say, oh, I want to be your pirate. I've had partners that have had boats that wanted to set up this scenario. And I'm like, no, honey, please don't. I actually get seasick. It's just not going to work. Let me have my fantasy. <laughs> Let me just have it. So when we're looking at the rape fantasy, if my partner has the rape fantasy, I'm going to guess that they want to be deeply attuned to, that they like a combination of this sense of authority that gives them a permission to have the pleasure that they don't just give themselves permission for, that maybe they had a religious or a good boy or a good girl background that they had to feel kind of suppressed or they have to put other people's needs first. So the rape fantasy, when it's their fantasy, is giving them permission. And that they also want this sense of someone, uh, the power, they want this sense of someone's power just right, just right. So if I grab you suddenly, that is going to burst adrenaline. It's also going to spike dopamine. What is Francesca going to do next? Mm. If I bite you or scratch you, that's going to release endorphins. And that's also a slightly altered state. So my way of making love with you as the ravisher, if I'm doing it accurately, if I've heard your your fantasy accurately, if I'm attuning to you accurately, is giving you the chemical cocktail that your body most wants. Can you unpack the word attunement? Yeah. So this is actually what so many people long for, but don't know how to put into words. It's actually ideally what we would have gotten as babies and children, but most often didn't. So, you know, there's that first, you know, nine months, 11 months where we're not talking. So we actually need caregivers who can read our cues. Is that their wet cry? Is that their tired cry? Is that their hungry cry? Is that their I want to be picked up cry? And if our, if our adult caregivers have done enough work on themselves and are skilled enough, they can listen accurately and see accurately to those nonverbal cues, those non-word oriented cues, because we're not speaking yet. Especially when that doesn't happen as a little one, the rest of our lives, we have this deep and profound hunger to have someone be able to hear us beneath our words, to see us beneath our actions, 
to help us almost come home to ourselves. And we want someone who's like deeply focused when they sometimes in Tantra and various sexual intimacy, they talk about presence. Presence is actually being deeply focused. Like in this moment, there's no one but Christina in my world. That little smile she just gave me with it just a little almost dimple in the side of her cheek. So adorable. Like Christina becomes my world. Her little catch in her breath. Her, you know, relaxation in her shoulder. That I'm noticing every little piece of this, whether her skin is flushing or getting a little cold. I'm just, she is my world. And if she is my world, then as each little nuance of her skin, her temperature, her breath, her eye dilation is being communicated to me, I'm letting myself feel it and shift, shift to match it or mm. shift to increase it, or maybe to calm it down a little bit. If I feel she's, oh, maybe that wasn't right for her. She's actually gotten a little stiff. I feel like something's happening. I, I'm not attuning. So let me slow down and take a breath. Feel a little deeper. Maybe go back to what I was doing a moment ago. Maybe try something else. A really great lover is, at, is the, they're, the one that they're bringing their attention to becomes their world. And their attuning is you can imagine that we have a, a limbic system that broadcasts that is broadcasting hormonally, that's broadcasting electromagnetically. And we have mirror neurons that accept this broadcast. But in order to be that really great lover, in order to be that person who can really attune, I have to get out of the part of my brain that's chattering, saying, am I doing this right? Am I having fun yet? Maybe I don't know what's going on. Does she really like me? If I'm in some kind of chattering, critical and anal analytical part of my brain, I'm not actually letting myself feel and respond to your body. And attunement is, is this deep fe feeling you, feeling me, feeling you space that comes from ventral vagal breathing, which is uh, a deep breath that gets us out of the activated sympathetic, with, which is anxiety and irritation is activated sympathetic or activated dorsal, which is just placation. You know, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? You want to slap me. You know, but the third time I'm asking you if my touch is doing it right, you just probably want to scream. So placation is in the dorsal, collapse is in the dorsal. I'm doing it wrong. I should just give up. That's all in the dorsal. And in the ventral vagal part of our nervous system, we're flexible, creative, calm, and we can start to feel each other more deeply. That type of breath is breathing in the nose to the count of four with a little pause and then breathing out the mouth to the count of eight. In the nose to the count of four. Out the mouth to the count of eight. And so if I'm your lover, Christina, if I start to wonder, am I doing this right? Or am I missing something? I would want to return to my breath first. So that I can calm down that, you know, sympathetic anger, anxiety, or that placation, nervousness collapse too and be able to be back in what's called focus or presence or attunement with you. It's an interesting mindfulness without having that crazy, all those crazy thoughts. And now I'm feeling into you. And that's what most people long for, but they don't know how to say it. Hmm. In that experience, the one who is attuning to the other, if we're framing it in the ideology of BDSM is the dom. They're the one that is penetrating energetically into the submissive who is then surrendering into the experience that is being led by the one who is providing the space, like who's attuning to the other. 
Yeah. So you would think other words for dominant are our leader, guide, creator of the experience, space holder for the experience. And the dictionary definition of dominant is competent, confident, and holding authority. Competent, confident, and holding authority. It's not domineering. Domineering is a completely different word in the dictionary. So when we are, in a sense, the loving dominant, whether or not we identify as kinky or BDSM, when we're the loving dominant, then I'm saying to you, Christina, nowhere to go, nothing to do. This is all about you, baby. Just take a breath. I've got you. And I'm holding a space, a container, a confidence, an authority that your nervous system can relax into. Mm. If I speak into or, or speak more specifically around um, male female relationships, mm -hmm. oftentimes the role is you know there, there's there's the the woman is wanting to be penetrated by the man, so the man is usually the initiator in the early parts of the relationship. However, statistically, that once a couple has been together for quite some time. Or um, maybe again, they they've married, so they're past. They're they're in their marrying years. That typically, um, Esther Perel says that the woman will be the one who starts getting bored sexually before the man. I have to wonder if that's because the woman is giving so much, um, like like the, the man is responsible so often for creating these sexual spaces that the woman's creativity isn't necessarily brought into it. And so she's, there's too much, like the man is like, oh, okay, fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep doing this over. And then she's like, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, but not necessarily taking the initiative to recreate the experience to bring aliveness into their sexual play. You know, I think that this is a case of we are undereducated in the sexual cycles, the sexual romantic cycle. So the really high dopamine and adrenaline is time limited. It's going to last like a couple months. It's, it's, it's set up to have a start fucking. Then the next phase that the body goes into biologically is supported by phenylethylalamine and oxytocin and serotonin. And it creates the falling in love stage, which is about nine months, maybe two years. And that's designed to be long enough to like have the baby and then the baby to kind of just be old enough to, you know, kind of be more on its own. Now, if a couple's capable of moving into the attachment phase, that's when they really start to relax and feel comfortable with each other, comforted with each other. But that, that increase of oxytocin and serotonin and the drop of the phenylethylamine will have sometimes both of them feel, uh, you know, less excitement. Less, if we're used to basing our, am I in the mood for, do I feel that <gasps> anticipation? If we base our in the mood on, do I feel that in kind of anxious adrenaline? Then if that's where we're looking for our mood, we're going to feel bored by this comfort and calmness. If we've been looking for, you know, Am I in the mood to be based on the merging that phenylethylalamine is? This sense of oneness, like almost like being on ecstasy or MDMA. If I'm looking for that to be the feeling, that goes away as well. So how can I look toward to feel where is my libido? Where is my arousal without blaming my partner for not doing it right? So by the way, I'm a recovering sex and love addict, combination sex, love. And so I would be that girl that when all the hormones were off, I would think he's not doing it right. He's boring. He's not a good lover. He's not a good lover for me. And do you know that resenting my partner did nothing to improve my relationship? Mm -hmm. Wild, right? <laughs> it never helped. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and eventually I saw enough of a pattern with me being so excited by the next lover because, and I didn't know it was the hormones, that it wasn't that he, this next lover was the best lover I ever met. It was that all the hormones were its own high that were having any touch that he did feel like it was the best. 
So every time he would be the best. And then when I would fall in love with the phenylethylamine, we had so much in common. And then every time the hormones were off, oh, Christina, he's not who I thought he was. You know, he's not. He doesn't touch me the way he used to. He's not romantic the way he used to. And I'm bored now. And then I would justify leaving. So I got tired of that merry-go-round and I started researching. And then I realized if I was wanted a sustainable love life, you know, you don't have to want one. But if I did want one, I was going to have to take ownership of my own hormonal structures and patterns. And that's when I started to look at, oh, what creates, and I think you're pointing to this, what creates dopamine? So if dopamine is created by newness, then maybe let's have regular little adventures where we go different places. If adrenaline is created by excitement and anxiety, well, let's create something that has a little bit of that in it or ask him to do it and explain this to him so he understands. If um, another way that I like to work with newness is I really explored the, um, I have something called the inner aspect method. Richard Schwartz has the parts system. Um, Jung has archetypes. I started to explore that we have one body, but there's all these different beings inside of me. There's the primal. There's the, you know, tired mama. There's the helper healer. You know, how can I answer these questions and make it great for people? You know, there's the playful young part. Let's go play, Christina. Let's just go swing on swings. That would be super fun. I mean, that there's all these different parts in me. And when I started to experiment with this really awesome partner in saying, what happens if we go bring these young, innocent wonder selves together and go swing on swings and go just play and have fun and just kick stones that we would go home and make love from those parts in a new way. And then if I said, well, what if we explore our primals? So I'm just going to like, let's breathe into like feeling like what's a a big cat or a big wolf. And now let's start like clawing and wrestling. Well, those parts made love differently. And we started to call it inner polyamory. Well, that's what newness too. So every time we introduced a new pairing to each other, it was like having a new lover. <laughs> and so we, we want to get smart about this if we want our relationships to be sustainable. And so we want to understand how our own hormones work and take charge of them and talk to our partner and say, hey, this is how they work. Let's take charge of them together. Now, when, when you think about hormones and understanding your own hormones, what does, like, I know you're, you're giving us information of, of, you know, what to expect, but each of us are unique beings. How does one person start to begin to understand their own unique hormonal process? I would definitely recommend, you know, Google searching. And I have documents if people want to reach me too on the neurobiology, the neurobiology of love and lust. So there's little YouTube videos, some of them very short. There might be podcasts. There's this podcast. I've got documents. They can reach me, relationshipdiva at gmail.com and say neurobiology of love and lust. And I'll send them a document. So you know, they start to research. Now you might look and say, oh, I think I like more adrenaline and a little dopamine. You know, I like extreme sports. I like horror movies. Like I like, you know, um, the kind of rides that you feel like you're about to die. Well, then you like a lot of adrenaline. And then if, you know, then you might look at, oh, I like that. Just that little hit of like going online and like, paging through whatever I like to page through because each little page is a hit. Oh, I like dopamine. I think I like a lot of dopamine. Or you might say, oh, wow, I love romantic films. I bet I like a lot of phenylethylamine. I love the sense of like, just oh, so dreamy. So we want to kind of be able to map ourselves because there is a range, right? And then endorphin people also like the burn. They like to feel the burn working out. They like to, you know, there's something about going to the edge of their capacity and even feeling so, like that they're needing something painful that feels good to them. Then you probably like endorphins. So knowing what you like, which I didn't used to know at all. I was such a mess for my partners because I'd be like, it's not working. Well, what would you like? 
And then I would have no idea. <laughs> I mm-hmm. really have no idea. Mm-hmm. Like, try something. Well, that's not working either. And I was, I don't think I was very inspiring at that point. But being able to say, oh, these are the hormones that I like. And these are some of the ways that you get there. That's a lot more to work with. So, yeah, those kinds of uh, videos or podcasts or documents can help us go, oh, that's me. That's me. Once I know that, I can start to talk to my partner or even a new lover about what's going to be more likely to delight my body. Did neglect this subject in school. I mean, you know, I get it that even if we did have it in primary educational curriculums, it would be, you know, the basics because of how much can you take a teenager through this sort of more adult type of information. So finding ways to study sexuality in our grown up lives is so important for our imagination. I, I recently went to a erotic cabaret and we <laughs> were to submit our fantasies and the <laughs> Uh, the the show would would play them out. And <laughs> one of my my fantasies I wrote was, you know, the, the, the quote how um, there's a famous quote by Henry Ford. And he says that if I would have asked the people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses because mm. we didn't know cars was even possible. A lot mm-hmm. of times in our sexuality, where our imagination is limited <laughs> because we haven't even seen what is out there and available to us and stopped to even just pay attention to this, this whole like Mm -hmm. smorgasbord of, you know, it's like you go to Disney and you get to see all these rides, but like, I I just am picturing like, what would a, like a universal studios for sex look like? (laughs) Right. Because we can't ask for something if we don't know that the menu exists. So if I were to say, do you want pizza or hamburgers? You, you know, you think it's pizza or hamburgers. If I even say, well, would you like something different? If you don't know that there's something besides pizza and hamburgers, how would you ask for something different? Even if I said, honey, just tell me, I'll cook it. And so we do that in sex. You know, do you want, you know, penetrative sex, you know, or or oral sex? Well, there's so much more. But if we don't know that there's something more and you say, what else would you like, Francesca? I'll do it for you. I might, I have looked like the deer in the headlights, like, I don't know. I don't know what's on the menu. I don't even know if I like what's on the menu. And I often recommend for couples to have at least like one night a week. That's just literally exploration and experimentation where the bar is learning something new about yourself or your partner. It's not having an orgasm. It's not the best sex you ever had. It's literally, oh, I didn't know I liked my elbow licked. Who knew? Who knew? Until you tried that, I didn't know. Or I didn't know my right nipple was more sensitive than my left. Who knew? So we're not trying to get somewhere other than gathering information. Now, later we can play with that information. But most of us don't even have that information about ourselves, let alone someone else. Mm. You know what I'm experiencing now for the first time in my uh, sex life is... Who do tell? (laughs) <laughs> I have never I, I used to I went through a phase of thinking like I I wasn't a squirter mm-hmm. and I'm with this new play partner right now and I have never been so wet <laughs> like Ooh. he will literally go down on me for like six hours and you've got if, to be exaggerating no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Six hours. I mean, this is like a combination of, um, you know, a few hours, you know, probably like uh, uh, like four hours in the evening and then a couple hours in the morning. OK. And still even so much of it, like he's super kinky. So I started to play with that and requested that we um, bottle the Embrita. So I'm even learning what Embrita is. Ah, you, yes. yes. Yes, I know what Embrita is. Yes. Um, and so, but we should probably tell our listeners. I would audience. love to tell, but, but, we, <laughs> but I got a jar and I had him label the jar, um, your majesty's fluids or your majesty's juice. And the <laughs> idea was, you know, we're going to take this and like package all my Embrita up um, and put it in the freezer. And then every day he would wear it as 
um, I put it on his body and he oh, had I my pheromones it. and my Rita on his body. I even purchased, <laughs> um, last, last week I did a ayahuasca, Iboga ayahuasca journey. And in my, one of my, sometimes when I'm in these journeys, I create domain names and new businesses <laughs> and I purchased amritajars.com. And I was like, I'm going to make a company that creates Amrita jars for people to catch their fluids. And, uh, and in, in it, I'm going to, it'll be an opportunity to teach people how to squirt because in my mm-hmm. early forties, I didn't even know I had this ability to be mm-hmm. so wet and so fluid. So mm-hmm. yeah, I would love to share with the, the audience about what is in Rita. So um, I just also want to say that there's a range for when women are accessing this, you know, a G-spot, type of orgasm that allows them to squirt or to, you know, be, have more like that little, little or big burst of fluids. So just like men, I, you know, some men, there's a lot of cum. Some men have a lot of pre-cum, some don't. Some have a lot of cum, some have less cum and there's a range. So in human masculine, um, ejaculation and in terms of their pre-cum, there's a range. It's similar for women. So, you know, every woman can get wetter or have that that kind of burst of something that comes forth. And some women, it's going to be huge. You know, it's like it might be a cup full or whatever. And some might be, you know, a dropper full. And, you know, so we never want to shame ourselves wherever we are on that, you know, bell curve on that spectrum. And there is potential that most people haven't reached yet. And this, um, it's when we're, kind of tickling the G-spot area, which is kind of the roof, inside roof of the vulva. And, you know, you could look up where is the G-spot. You could look up, you know, where is G-spot orgasm. You could look up where is, um, uh, you know, female ejaculation orgasm. You could look up things like that. And when this happens in this kind of come hither moment, come hither motion in the vulva with a finger that's kind of I'm, I'm doing the motion. You can't see it. That's kind of beckoning forward. There's a point where a woman will will have this orgasm and have this release of pleasure that's different than a clitoral orgasm, the just the tip of the clitoris, and will often have this this burst of liquid. And they've studied it. It is not urine. It is its own compilation of nutrients. And in ancient Hindu texts, in ancient tantric texts, they call this Amrita, which is like a sweet nectar, like a nectar of the gods. And it was felt that if a man actually uh, drank this Amrita, that it would help his health. It would help his longevity, Mm. that it was these nutrients were were extremely healthful for him to take in. And then I love that you're doing, you know, the four hour, the two hour, because in Taoist and in tantric, Hindu tantric uh, texts, books about or teachings about sexuality, we want to stay in a high state of arousal for a minimum, minimum of 45 minutes. So this doesn't have to be penetration. This doesn't have to be 45 minutes of oral sex. This doesn't have to be 45 minutes of, you know, uh, pleasuring someone with your hand, but it's doing, it's creating like breath and arousal and teasing. And there's a whole, you know, kink in in BDSM called tease and denial, where you bring someone to kind of a higher and higher state of arousal. And then you pause for a moment. They also have that in Tantra. They just call it something different. They call it extended lovemaking. And you might go near the nipples and then away. You might go near the genitals and then away. You might start to arouse the genitals and then go to some other part of the body because you're wanting someone, your beloved, to go to higher and higher states of arousal for longer periods of time. What this does for the body is it actually boosts the immune system. It it helps the blood flow of the heart. Like it helps the heart. It helps the lungs. It can even help, like it helps all the blood flow, like the eyesight. And when I would, I don't know if you've noticed this, but when I would do these extended lovemaking sessions with my beloved, about 45 minutes to an hour in, my nasal passages would clear. 
and my eyesight would get clearer. I could, everything got brighter. Are you noticing that too? I haven't paid attention that closely, <laughs> but I definitely will now. Yeah, it will, you know, and it, and it's so healthful for the body. So the longer you can stay in these states with your beloved, the healthier it is for you. Oh, and by the way, you'll, it's actually like aging backwards. It's incredibly good for your. And that's for both partners. That's for the partners, partners. both partners. And then the Amrita itself, um, it talks more about men drinking it, but technically probably both genders could drink it. It would be good for you. I've heard too that it also can secrete in the mouth and in the eye. Hmm. Um, I've, you know, there, I haven't heard about the eye. I've heard about that, you know, there's that point sometimes when you're getting really close to your lover's lips with that anticipation and you just start to salivate, you know, like there's this sweetness. You can like feel this sweetness Mm. kind of come into your mouth. Mm -hmm. and your mouth gets wet, Mm -hmm. that is also very delicious to exchange with our beloveds and good for us. Mm. Gosh, I could, I, you know, this is like the similar to the last time that we had our podcast (laughs) where I just want it to keep going again and again, again. You know, if, if we had more time, I'd be curious to unpack attachment theories. Mm -hmm. Um, and also because, you know, oftentimes the uh, secure is, um, celebrated. It's like, we all Mm -hmm. want, we want to get to the secure, (laughs) but I hear a little bit of, you know, in the hormones of what you're speaking to this, you know, the nervousness or anxiety is also part of the, um, attraction Mm-hmm. process that brings us closer to a partner of course avoidance you know running away but there's even something of like <laughs> moving away and then coming back right so, come here go away <laughs> yeah so these these other these other um you know styles of attachment can play into our sexuality as well um, so that's that's coming to mind and I also would probably unpack uh owning our desires I mm-hmm. see so much in the dating space of people not wanting to say what they want because they don't want to, they feel as though they don't want to manipulate somebody else's experience, mm. but in the not manipulating someone else's experience, they're not giving them the, the, you know, this level of like the information, possi- the, the information. And also too, it's like, if I, you know, if I said to my partner and I was like, I, your lips are just so amazing. And I love that they are mine Mm -hmm. and that you were only to -hmm. kiss me Mm -hmm. during this period Mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. But that that's what we're fearful of saying in, in, even though like, like it's kind of, you know, don't claim, claim, we want to be claimed, but we want to be sovereign. And this kind of playing with the energy and, and, and also then suppressing our true desires at times, mm. uh, because we don't want to manipulate someone else's experience or whatnot, is stopping us from more having like these greater fulfilling relational lives. Yeah. And so I love this. So we've got in- attachment to go over and how to bring deliciousness to our erotic life and release shame if we're in one of these other attachment styles. And then we have that unpacking of how to really own our desires and communicate it in a way that's connective. I feel like a lot of times we're afraid we'll be rejected or we might, we don't have the skill to say it in a way that's actually connective and inspiring. So it sounds like we're just going to have to do this one more time. Let's do it one more time. (laughs) Let's do it one more time. I love that. Thank you, Francesca, for um, joining me for another episode. Um, You're, you're so fascinating um, <laughs> in your existence and um, and you have such a wealth of information and knowledge around relating. So I'm really appreciative of that. Uh, thank you so much, sweetheart. And I'm, I'm also just want to drop a little note that I'm, I'm currently in conversation about creating a couple sensual healing pathway when partners are noticing that maybe one partner has more trauma in their attachment style or background that's getting in the way of their being present and accessing sexuality. And if couples are really devoted to each other, how to actually have a plan and a pathway to bring healing to that. Thank you. I had a a session with a couple yesterday and 
you know, the, the conclusion of it, it was a discovery session was for them to, yes, yeah, study love together, study mm. relationship together, make space to do that. Um, and you'll feel more connected to your partner. So I love that you're creating these offerings out in the world. And I'm excited to share more of them through We Deepen. Woohoo. <laughs> Well, thank you all for listening to another episode of Deepen with Christina. If you did enjoy this podcast, again, please like, subscribe, rate it, give it five stars, send it to a friend. Let's all, you know, imagine a world where everybody was thriving in love and experiencing the best sex of their life. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, until next time. I love you all. Bye for now. Mwah.